morning, everybody. Welcome to the very first in a new speaker series um, called Nine Billion and Counting. Uh, this speaker series builds on uh, a conference that was held here in St. Paul on October 17th, uh, 2016. And it's really my pleasure to, to welcome you. I'm Jim Bradeen. I'm co-director of the Stakeman Borlaug Center. And the Stakeman Borlaug Center, uh, along with our college advancement team, uh, has organized this speaker series. I want uh, in particular to thank Britta Hansen, um, Mary Buschetti, Susan Thurston Hammerski, Barb Fies, and Maggie Willenta. These, these individuals not only came up with this idea for the speaker series, but have really worked tirelessly to bring it to fruition. So this is the, the very first in a series, um, and I, I thank them, as well as CFANS, for financially supporting this, this seminar series. So this series really uh, builds on the idea of food security and all of its complexity, ranging from policy issues to social science issues to um, science and, and food distribution issues. So increasingly, food security issues are complicated. In CFANS, we're well positioned to tackle some of these issues. We work globally with international partners. The seminar series is meant to bring new flavor to the work that we're doing in CFANS and the work of our international partners and to highlight the, the interdisciplinarity of food security issues. Um, so we really hope you enjoy this, this new seminar, um, or this new speaker series. Today, uh, we have a, a honored guest to kick off this series. I'm very happy to introduce Roger Thoreau. Roger is a best-selling author. Um, he was a correspondent with the um, Wall Street Journal and spent 20 years in Africa and Europe. Uh, his coverage of global affairs has spanned the Cold War, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the release of Nelson Mandela and the end of apartheid, the wars in, the, in former Yugoslavia, uh, the humanitarian crises of the first decade of the century, along with 10 Olympic Games. In, 20, uh, in 2003, Roger Thoreau, um, along with his Wall Street Journal colleague Scott Kilman, wrote a series of stories on famine in Africa, which was selected as a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting. Their reporting on humanitarian and developmental issues was also honored by the United Nations. Thoreau and Kilman are the authors of the book Enough, Why the World's Poorest Starve in an Age of Plenty, that was published in 2009. That same year, they were honored with the Action Against Hunger's Humanitarian Award. Um, Roger Thoreau is also the author of The Last Hunger Season, A Year in an African Farm Community on the Bank of Change, that was published in 2012, and, in, uh, and, and author of The First 1,000 Days, A Crucial Time in Mother, for Mothers and Children and the World, which was published in 2016. Today, um, Roger is a, a senior fellow with the Global Agriculture and Food Policy in, uh, on the Chicago Council of Global Affairs. And today he will share with us his insights in our role in humanitarian and developmental issues. So it is my distinct uh, honor to welcome Roger Thoreau. Good morning. I need to turn this on. Lights green. How's that? Yay, I talk loud enough anyway, uh, for all of us. Thank you very much, Jim, Britta, for bringing us all together. Mary, oh, here comes Mary. Thank you uh, for arranging this, for, uh, for bringing me here. Next time, uh, we need to turn the heat up a little bit, right? Uh, outside, so I was lost here about a year ago, right? Uh, and uh, it was even colder, I think. There had been, there had been snow or considerable snow, even more, I guess, than, than this time that came through. Uh, I was staying downtown in, in Minneapolis and uh, I yeah, wasn't prepared uh, as well as I should have. I'm from Northern Illinois, so I should know better. Uh, and I went on a search for a sweater uh, to keep me warmer and went to four or five or six department stores downtown, including Target. I figured out it's their headquarters store. <laughs> I'll have something. None of them had their sweaters out yet. They said winter winter hasn't begun yet, so our winter clothing isn't out yet. And it was like, oh, 
you have to adjust to things, right? And so, uh, so this year, yeah, uh, a little more prepared. And I'll be on my way to uh, Des Moines in the world uh, food, food prize uh, later uh, in the week after uh, a road trip with, uh, with Jake to see uh, uh, work on uh, Kernza and some of the other uh, advances that are going on uh, here at the university uh, now. Uh, and thanks for uh, inaugurating uh, this series. Nine billion uh, and counting, it's yeah, the challenge of our time. Uh, I think the supreme challenge for all the students uh, at this university is, as they go forward um, to solve and eliminate and conquer hunger and malnutrition, which unfortunately still abides uh, with us despite all the great efforts at this university and Dr. Borlaug and, and his great uh, legacy. Uh, and yeah, and delighted to be here in the uh, literal shadow uh, of Dr. Borlaug and all the buildings here uh, and uh, because he's been uh, yeah such an inspiration for my work certainly for everything that, that uh, uh, you guys do uh, and uh, yeah, many that have followed in his in his footsteps so uh, congratulations um, on that and yeah his his work and his spirit um, still with us and, and, and needed uh, more uh, than ever. And thanks everybody for coming. Uh, I really appreciate uh, that. Uh, and I just wanted to start by apologizing for anybody who came and saw the title for this, The Real Hunger Games, and has come expecting that maybe Jennifer Lawrence will show up, uh, or any of her fellow cast members. <coughs> Alas, they will not. Or will they? Mary, Britta? I've... <laughs> you haven't, haven't arranged any surprises, right? Uh, but it actually should come with the subtitle. Uh, the Real Hunger Games, uh, Hunger and Malnutrition in the, the 21st uh, Century. So this isn't about some dystopian world and some problem that exists in science fiction somewhere, but it's a problem that so very much still uh, exists and abides um, with us. And even though it's with us, it's not, you know, perhaps in, in, in the minds of many people, it's a problem that's over there somewhere, something they see on the, on the news and these horrible Im Im images that continue to plague us and will come wherever there's kind of a hunger crisis or famine that, that uh, comes up or a natural disaster that causes uh, great hunger and suffering. Uh, but it's not just over there somewhere. It's something that's in our, uh, in our midst, uh, uh, certainly across the United States, in Minnesota, in, in all our towns, at the university uh, and the campus. It's one of the, the more, I think, unsettling uh, new areas of interest and, and um, uh, research that's going on in a number of universities is just what is the food insecurity situation on campuses uh, and the percentage of students uh, that are also dealing with food insecurity issues while they're here on campus or perhaps come from families uh, that were food insecure and kind of now they're here kind of dealing with things uh, on their own. So it's really kind of one of the, the troubling and surprising underbellies of uh, hunger and food insecurity really in our midst uh, and, uh, 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 you know, on all our campuses and people sitting next to us in the classrooms. Um, and uh, uh, so it's, it's the, the Real Hunger Games, and I call kind of the three books that I've done the Real Hunger Games trilogy. Uh, again, not the dystopian uh, trilogy books, but uh, again, uh, there is, my mantra as a journalist is to outrage and inspire. So with each of the books, there's a central outrage uh, that kind of motivates the reporting. Uh, in, in the first book, uh, Enough, Why the World's Poor, Starving Age of Plenty, uh, that Scott and I did when we were still at the Wall Street Journal uh, together. The central outrage is, and the book came out in 2009, kind of in the wake of the hunger crisis of 2007, 2008, uh, stockpiles of the major grains and cereals uh, uh, kind of falling to their lowest levels that we had seen in decades. That was triggering shortages, triggering price increases. After this long period coming out of the Green Revolution of staple prices, um, food and commodity prices around the world. Um, and suddenly in 2007, 2008, there were uh, then food uh, riots that were then breaking out in dozens of countries around the world. Some governments even fell uh, because of that. And that was really a shock uh, to the system, to many governments, certainly here are government in Washington, uh, other governments in the ritual, what's going on uh, in the world? 
And so uh, Scott and I, with our reporting, we decided to combine all that into uh, the book Enough. And the core outrage in Enough is how we had brought hunger and malnutrition with us into the 21st century, into this grand new millennium of ours, despite all the scientific achievements and advances that we had seen in the previous uh, century, in the previous decades, uh, primarily the, the work of the Green Revolution and the great uh, uh, things that, that came out of that, conquering and knocking back uh, famine, uh, particularly in the subcontinent, in India, Pakistan, and it spread through elsewhere through Asia and into Latin America. Despite all that uh, progress and despite all kind of the, tele the, the communications capabilities that we have literally at our fingertips, despite all that, we had brought this medieval suffering with us into the 21st century. And so this work still abided with us. So that was the central outrage of that book. Kind of what's wrong with us? Why have we brought this, this with us? Why does it still persist? Why do we tolerate it? That then led me away from the Wall Street Journal because I wanted to write more about these, uh, the, these issues in a, in a, a, a long, long form uh, narrative journalism and figure the, the, the books are the, the proper kind of longer narrative to do that in. Uh, and so the second book then, The, the Last Hunger Season, then uh, the central outrage of this book is how kind of all this had led that we had brought hunger with us into the 21st century. The hungriest people in the world are farmers and primarily smallholder farmers, and the horrible, hideous, awful, shameful, uh, obscene oxymoron that that is, hungry farmers. And how did that happen? And how had these, these smallholder farmers of the world, particularly the smallholder farmers of, of Africa, uh, that the world was viewing them as too poor, too remote, too small, well, who's going to bother with them? kind of the Washington consensus that had emerged after the, 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 the Green Revolution that Dr. Borlaug would rail against, uh, was that, yeah, the reason why they're poor is because they're farmers and smallholder farmers. Maybe they should be doing something else. They should be working in factories, making our t-shirts and, and, and underwear and socks that we don't make in the United States or a rich world anymore. And if they're hungry, we can feed them. And so this, this, this kind of horrible situation that the hungriest people in the world are, are smallholder farmers. I followed four families in Western Kenya through the course of the year to write about as they, as they kind of descend into the hunger season, this period of profound deprivation between when their previous harvest runs out and they're waiting for the next harvest to come in. And that can last for maybe a, a week or a couple of weeks to, to several months. One of the four farm families that I followed in, in the course of the year, uh, their hunger season stretched on for nine or 10 months. And it was, it was really profound. You could see the family uh, shrink. They had four children, shrink physically. Uh, four children, uh, all malnourished. The smallest one, uh, David, was two and three years old at the time uh, of the reporting uh, and writing. And that had me thinking, well, kind of what happens to these children when they get off to such a lousy start in life and they're malnourished uh, from the early days. And Sapora, the, the, the mother of the family, and as we all know, I mean, it's the moms, it's the, it's, it's the, the, the women in the families who are doing most of the farming, particularly the, the subsistence farming and growing the crops that the family is eating every day. Uh, she had told me that the most miserable point or the deepest form of misery in the hunger season is to be a mother, is to be a parent, unable to silence the crying of a hungry child. She was feeling a failure on two fronts both as a farmer, because she wasn't growing enough to feed her family throughout the year, ostensibly because they just didn't have access to the essential elements of farming that we all take for granted, living here in a country of such an, an, an estate and a, and a region of such abundance. So failing as a farmer, I'm not growing enough to feed my family. Second failure that she felt she was failing as a mother because her children were malnourished. That then again had me as I said, figuring, so what happens with these children uh, and these families that get off to such a miserable or a lousy start in life because of the malnutrition from, 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 from birth and even for the mom during pregnancy? That then led me to write the first thousand days. Uh, the first thousand days, the period of time from when the mom first becomes pregnant to the second birthday of the child, 
uh, it's the period where uh, it's the most important period for individual growth. The establishment of the firm foundation for good physical uh, growth uh, throughout a child's life. Uh, the, it's the time when the brain is growing most rapidly and expansively. That thousand day period already while the child's in the womb, so many things are happening already with the neural connections uh, that are so critical. So kind of the cognitive development uh, is really taking off um, in the first thousand day period. And it's the period where the immune system is being strengthened uh, that will then help the child throughout life and ward off chronic diseases uh, later in life. So it's the most important period of individual human development and by extension it's the most important period of development of families and communities and societies and countries and the world as a whole. That our children get off to the best start in life. And of course the thing that is fueling all of this is, is good nutrition. Uh, and if in this time period there is uh, any kind of lack of access to food, any lack of access to the, to the essential vitamins and minerals and the nutrients that are needed for the development of the child, that then leads to stunting. So the central outrage of the first thousand days book then is this, what I think is a, a truly outrageous fact, one of the most shocking things in our world today, is that one in every four children under five years old in our world today, one in every four is stunted in some manner, either physically or cognitively. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more uh, later uh, about kind of the impact of stunting and what that means and what that should mean uh, to all of us. And so that's kind of then the outrage, part of the outrage and inspiration that's kind of driving this. Again, that, that's what's wrong with us, that we allow this to, uh, to abide. And as a journalist, hopefully then through storytelling and through, through uh, narratives developed around real people. So again, not people in some dystopian world or some novel or some science fiction, but these are real people to say, this is kind of a situation that is still among us and how it should bother us. And what's wrong with us? Do we allow this to, to abide and how it impacts all of us? So it's not just over there somewhere, but it's here um, among us. That's the outrage. And then there's also the inspire. And as one can see examples in all of these books, the people on the ground, both the farmers themselves and the families, they're inspirational in their work. They don't want to be in this situation, so what can they do about this? There's all the people that then are, are kind of trying to help somewhere along the way. Every, everybody in this room and the work that you're doing both as faculty, as students, what you've done in your careers, um, and, and, and so amazing to conquer hunger and malnutrition, uh, to you know, work in the, in the fields alongside uh, the farmers to create the conditions for them to be the best farmers uh, as possible and be as productive uh, as possible uh, for all of us. And of course, particularly in the first book, uh, enough, the great inspiration that then comes from Dr. Borlaug himself, who shows, and we all know this, what an individual can do. The inspiration that conquering hunger and malnutrition is something that every one of us can have something to do with. We can all contribute to it. So it's not like some of the other great challenges of the world. Uh, particularly medical challenges, uh, you know, uh, ending malaria, uh, coming up with a cure uh, for, for AIDS or, or, or prevention for HIV AIDS. You know, that largely will be done by work done by people in lab coat, working in a, in a laboratory somewhere, and the great minds and brains that they have that they can bring to this, and the people that can fund those efforts. The rest of us hoping, okay, looking for breakthroughs from them. But on this problem, on this great challenge of, of hunger and malnutrition, that we don't know what to do with. We have the precedents, we have the science, we have the technology and all the work that continues to go on here and other universities and then corporations and the support from philanthropists and governments and the NGOs and the humanitarians. We all know what to do and to do something for this. But again, at the center of all this, again, then a big central outrage is that the common will and particularly the political will uh, to get this done. David Beckman, who's a, a Lutheran minister who's the head of Bread for the World, he talks about the need to create the give a dam. And I think when a Lutheran minister starts talking about you know, creating the give a dam, we all ought to particularly pay attention to, <laughs> pay attention to, them, to him. He, uh, 
also World Food Prize laureate, will be in Des Moines again later this week. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, to, to, to the, the inspiration that then comes from everybody to also then raise the clamor and create this political will, because uh, hunger and malnutrition is above all a, a political uh, problem. And so the inspiration that comes from Dr. Borlaug and then personally with this kind of my journalistic out, mantra of outrage and inspire, I remember the first time, or I think one of the first times that I met him, was over breakfast in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Marriott Hotel across from the Reagan Center, uh, Reagan Building where USAID uh, is headquartered and was there with Ken Quinn, who's uh, the head of the World Food Prize. I was having breakfast with Dr. Borlaug. It's like really early in the morning, uh, and so he was up and he had ordered like a uh, uh, kind of almost everything that was on the menu. And Dr. Quinn says, Bob, he's an Iowa farmer. He has a robust breakfast, right? I don't know what I had ordered, but it was uh, something, you know, rather meager, pitiful in his estimation. So I said, yeah, I'll have some eggs too, uh, and oatmeal, uh, bring that as well. Uh, and so it was in kind of the, the course of the conversation. Uh, this would have been uh, just a couple of years before his death, maybe 2006, 2007, while doing reporting on this for the Wall Street Journal. I remember him slamming his hand on the table and creating a loud noise, slamming his palm uh, on the table, kind of in frustration that this problem of hunger and malnutrition continued to abide with us. And particularly in those years, in 2007, 2008, the hunger numbers going up again, the food crisis that we, that, that we were in the midst of uh, at that time, and uh, the outrage that was still in him that his work uh, continued to be needed to be done and that we had taken our, our our, uh, our eye off the ball uh, in that. Uh, and then obviously the inspiration and up until the time of his death, exhorting everybody, no, continue this push, particularly to the youth and the students. You must carry on and take us to this promised land that I have not been able to take us to in terms of totally conquering and eliminating uh, hunger and, and malnutrition. So that's been a huge inspiration for me, both in the writing and speaking, and particularly I love speaking on campuses uh, college campuses and at high schools, uh, and to give the message to all the, 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 the students, everybody in, in the faculty here know this, knows this so well, that no matter what your interest is, no matter what you're studying, whatever your major is, whatever your passion is, you all have something that you contribute to this great imperative of ending and conquering hunger uh, and malnutrition. Uh, you know, whether you're studying, you're doing the, the great work that is here on this campus and in these buildings uh, that directly applies to this uh, great task and challenge, or whether you're studying, you know, computer science, or the classics, or philosophy, or religion, or theology, or sociology, or economics, or engineering, uh, or architecture, or nursing, or medicine, uh, kind of any of these fields, or journalism, and the ability of journalists to, to raise the clamor, that if you think of it, and if this is an issue that really motivates you, there is something that you can do to apply to this issue. And so, again, that's in the all-encompassing nature of this is, this is the great, one of the great challenges, or perhaps the great challenge, where everybody can have an influence uh, and make a difference. And so, and that is still ever so necessary because, again, this problem still abides with us. Uh, it's great that this year, and starting this, this series and the lecture series, Nine Billion and Counting, that we're starting this now with the kickoff here, and, and, and honored to uh, be part of that. So again, thanks for having me here. Uh, is that we're coming up on, I think it's, it's maybe October 20th, so kind of towards the end of next year, where we begin the 50th anniversary year of Dr. Borlaug winning the Nobel Peace Prize. So I think it was on October 20th. It's in this book. I should have looked it up before I started rambling. I think it's October 20th where his wife in Mexico is getting phone calls from Europe uh, saying, we need to speak to Dr. Borlaug. Is he around? Uh, he's out in the fields. But we need to speak to him urgently. And it's like, well, like, who's this calling? It's the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. He has been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for this year. So she's like, oh my. Uh, drives out to the field where Dr. Borlaug is working, tracks him down, he sees her, gee, what's going on? He goes over to see her and, Norm, I'm getting phone calls. You've been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. And he said, the Peace Prize, well, that can't be. <laughs> Agriculture scientist. 
Can I win the Peace Prize? Just, oh, they keep calling, they, they need to talk with you. He's like, ah, I'm more busy in the field. Uh, that one, that can't be true. Two, I've got work to do. So he turns around and goes back to his, his work in the field, as he would want to do. And then later in the day, all these streams of cars are coming out, uh, filled with reporters and other people that are then clamoring, Dr. Borlaug, we must speak to you uh, about this. And it settles, it kind of settles into his mind. But I guess I really did win a Nobel Peace Prize, and this is something. And, knows immediately that his life is about uh, to change as he also then eventually then starts taking on more and more of this humanitarian statesman uh, mantle. But it's really interesting then of what the Nobel Peace Prize Committee said uh, in awarding that and why Dr. Borlaug, why for his work on the Green Revolution. Because it wasn't a prize, it wasn't one of the science prizes, but it was the Nobel Peace Prize. And the Nobel Committee proclaimed, the world has been oscillating between fears of two catastrophes, the population explosion and the atom bomb. Both pose a mortal threat. In this intolerable situation with the menace of doomsday hanging over us, Dr. Borlaug comes onto the stage and cuts the Gordian knot. He has given us a well-founded hope, an alternative of peace and of life, the Green Revolution. Borlaug, the committee said, had turned pessimism in, in, into optimism in this dramatic race between the population explosion and our production of food. So all his work in the wheat fields of Mexico and then deploying that everywhere, and Richard and I had a great talk about this yesterday, of, of the history and, and what this all meant for the world. Um, yeah, that, that, that through that putting the production of food ahead, ahead of the, the population growth, which was consuming so much uh, uh, worry and concern uh, back in those days. And then Dr. Borlaug's speech then later in December when he uh, accepts the Nobel Peace Prize. He talks about, and it's really prophetic uh, what he says. He is saying that, you know, yeah, kind of everybody who then was by his side uh, in the Green Revolution, all the, the great energy that comes out of here and his great mentors uh, here. And he talks about, yes, now we're at high tide of conquering malnutrition and hunger, agriculture, spreading agriculture development to other parts of the world. We're at high tide now, but we must be on guard about the ebb tide setting in. And he has a warning, and he says, if we allow hunger and malnutrition to persist into the future, we will be guilty of criminal negligence without extenuation and that will be a burden and a guilt too much for humanity to bear. So here we are now, 50 years later, or coming up on 50 years later. There's been the great progress of the Green Revolution, but we've also allowed this ebb tide to set in. Because from what, during the, times of the time of the Green Revolution, the investments that were coming in, and the backing of that, and the backing of the research at the universities, uh, about, I think it was 20%, 25% of all overseas development data at the time was going into agriculture development. By 2004, 2005, or by the time the, the, the food crisis sets in in 2007, 2008, that had dropped to about 3% or 4%. The spending on nutrition had basically withered away to less than 1% of all development spending. It was as if we congratulated ourselves and said, problem solved. Dr. Borlaug has won the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, what else is there to do uh, on this front? And this ebb tide period set in. The hunger numbers then were back on decline again. And as they are now, the FAO, uh, the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, the other UN organizations that, that contribute to this survey found that, yeah, yet again, uh, for the past year, the numbers continue uh, to be on the rise, stunting minor, a little bit of progress on that, hooray for that progress, but stunting still persists. Historical progress on these numbers, but the number of chronic hungry continues to persist at maybe about 850 million uh, people. The micronutrient deficient, about 2 billion people in the world. Stunting numbers, again, one in every four children under five in the world. Uh, anemia on the rise across the globe, including in, in, uh, in the United States. Uh, and for the first time in human history, 
the number of overweight and obese people equals the two billion uh, hungry, food insecure, micronutrient insufficient. And so if you add all that together, it's more than half of the world's population is uh, plagued and suffering and impacted by malnutrition in some manner. So this problem abides. This ebb tide uh, continues. This warning that we're guilty of criminal negligence without extenuation. And it should be a guilt and a burden that is too much for us to bear. So now we've got 50 years later, after Norman Borlaug is awarded for cutting the Gordian knot, a great phrase, we're now confronting this new Gordian knot, which is in part born of the success of the Green Revolution. Again, as Richard, we were talking about yesterday, and that I've talked to a number of others hear about over time. This time, the dramatic race is between two of our most pressing challenges nourishing the planet, same problem that Dr. Borlaug confronted, nourishing the planet and preserving the planet at the same time. Now the question is of how much to produce, as was the big goal of the Green Revolution, but now it's not so much so how much we produce or increase in production, although we still need to continue that, but it's what we produce and what we grow and how we grow it. And how, we, how can we do all that in harmony with the planet as we come up with all these planetary boundaries? How can we produce enough food to properly nourish an ever-growing and ever more prosperous population, nine billion and counting, and finally conquer global hunger and malnutrition while at the same time saving our planet from the consequences of these agricultural actions that threaten our environment, our biodiversity, and our human health? Kind of as each year goes by, it seems that these two challenges are on a collision course. So the new fear is not that we'll run out of food, but that we're doing our, our dooming ourselves by, and our planet by the way that we grow food. And so, again, the essence of today's challenge is not in how much we grow, but in what we grow and how we grow it. To satisfy all these shifting diets and meet the daily nutritional needs for proteins, vitamins and minerals crucial for this healthy individual and societal development. So, as always, we look for to agriculture to be our salvation, but without mitigating and reversing its impact on our planet, it can also contribute to our ruination. And so that's a lot of the work then that's going on here in the Forever Green uh, project, and, and Jake and I, when we set out this afternoon uh, <coughs> down in the southwest corner of the state uh, to look at the, the current project, uh, and the grasses and the perennials uh, and the efforts to do that that will help uh, preserve the soil, uh, lessen the impact of, of uh, the fertilizer and, and, and runoff, uh, and then also uh, hopefully cleanse and, and, and preserve the water, the drinking water uh, of those regions that has become an increasing problem throughout the Midwest uh, and everywhere. So we're looking at then this great need then for kind of this evergreen revolution uh, where we need this new era of human cooperation that focuses on agriculture and nutrition, but also the environment, climate change, human health, animal health, plant health, insect health, soil health, water health. The impact and the work that's being done here then by the colleague that Mary's always trying to connect us with uh, on the pollinator front and the collapsing pollinator. Uh, communities and how, how our food system that's that emerged from the Green Revolution has basically wreaked havoc with the pollinator communities around the world. And as I talk to pollinators, you know, they say and remind me, hey, one of every three bites of food that we take is thanks to pollinators. So these disappearing and collapsing pollinator communities should be of great concern for all of us. So how do we continue to grow the food that we need and nourishment while also preserving and protecting uh, uh, the planet. So this era of this new Gordian knot. For hunger still continues to uh, impact uh, all of us. You know, hunger knows no borders. Uh, the stunting, the childhood malnutrition. And so that's why I wanted to write about that in the first thousand days. So I'll, I'll just talk a little bit uh, more about that. So again, the central outrage of our time, I think that it's one of every five, one of every four children in the world 
uh, today on the year five uh, that are stunting, largely <coughs> beyond nutrition. So in the developing world, it's one in three uh, children that are stunted. Uh, in this book, I followed moms and children through the thousand day period in India, Uganda, Guatemala, and Chicago. Chicago, that is not just a problem over there, but it's a problem also in our own midst. When our own children don't get off to the, good, the best start in life as possible, again, because of the diets of the moms and then what's available once, once the children are, are eating solid foods. Poverty plays a huge role in that in all the places of the world. But in India, the malnutrition rate is, is you know, about 50, 40 to 50 percent of, of, of children uh, in the country. In Guatemala, it's 50 percent nationwide in the western highlands of Guatemala. Uh, where I was following these families, it's 70%, it's upwards of 70%. 70% is the west in the western hemisphere, it's the worst in the western hemisphere. And Guatemala is basically a three hour plane ride from Houston and Miami. It's right in our backyard. The worst malnutrition problem, the worst childhood stunting problem in the western hemisphere. So stunting, it's become kind of an ever increasing or more popular measure of uh, malnutrition by the, by the nutritionists and the folks working uh, in that realm. And stunting, stunted, I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it's a harsh word, it's an ugly word. It's, 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 it's rude, stunting, stunted. So the medical definition of, of, of stunting is too short for, it's height for age, so too short for age. But that doesn't do justice to what the true impact of stunting is. So you hear that, you try to imagine the images and it's like, you know, well, kind of what does that mean, too short uh, for age? What stunting really is, it's a life sentence of underachievement and underperformance. And in most instances, it's rendered by the time a child is two years old. As I said, that's the period of when the foundation for good physical growth is happening and also the cognitive development. So the cognitive stunting then becomes really uh, important. The stunting of all these of all these uh, 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 neural processes that are going on, like millions per second uh, that are going on, both when a child is developing in the womb and then you know, throughout these first uh, two or three years uh, of life. So that's why I say it's kind of this most important period of individual and, and, and human uh, development. And again, good nutrition is the fuel uh, for all of this. So this life sentence of underachievement and underperformance it's an impact that rolls through time and place. You know, it's like when you have a pebble or a stone and you throw it into a placid pond and the pebble hits the water, then all these ripples start forming. That's the impact of stunting and the, the impact of stunting of an individual child. And so these ripples spread and the first ripple that comes out is the ripple on the individual child, him or herself. And again, one in every four children under five in our world today, stunted children become stunted adults. That's why these ripples spread across time. First ripple, the impact on the individual. If they're stunted, particularly cognitive stunting, they'll be spending less time in school. When they're in school, they have a lower ability to learn. Stunted children become stunted adults. When they're in the labor force, their productivity is less. They'll average 20 to 20 to 40 percent less in wages throughout their lifetime, and they have a higher propensity for chronic uh, diseases. It's also a weird uh, relationship that stunted, malnourished children then have a higher incidence of overweight and obesity uh, later in life, just because of kind of the epigenetics and other things that are going on uh, as a, as a uh, child already in the womb, uh, a malnourished child is developing and getting the signals from the mother that oh from the nutrients and the food level that mom is eating while the child is developing the womb, is already getting the signals uh, and the impulses that I'm gonna be born into a resource scarce world. So genes start changing and taking shape to conserve energy in a different sense, to break down sugars and fats in a different sense. And so maybe later in the life when they're in a situation where they have more abundant food for them, the body is, is then uh, processing them in a different, uh, Weight, which then will lead to the overweight uh, and obesity or that inverse relationship. The next ripple then becomes the families. The climb out of poverty is that much steeper for these families. Because if they have one stunted child, if they have more children, they probably have more than just that, uh, the one stunted child. Uh, 
if they're earning 20 to 40 percent less, it's, it's, it's less than a full wage that these children are contributing. It's higher health care costs uh, throughout life. So this climb out of poverty then becomes that much more dif difficult. The next ripple then are the communities where these children are growing up. This is the weakened labor pool, a less educated labor pool, a less productive labor pool. The next ripple then becomes countries and regions as a whole and their loss of economic activity. So countries have then started uh, charting this, the impact of uh, the economic impact of stunting and malnutrition. And in places like Guatemala and India, it's maybe six or eight percent of their, of, of their annual GDP, the equivalency that's lost because of this cumulative impact of childhood malnutrition and stunting. Ethiopia did its calculations and it was 16 percent, 16 percent loss of their, of, of, of their GDP equivalency every year. Regionally, Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, the two places of the world that the, num the absolute numbers and the incident rates of stunting and childhood malnutrition are the highest. There the World Bank calculations are that those great regions of the world lose 11 percent of GDP growth and GDP impact every year because of the cumulative impact of childhood malnutrition and stunting. These regions are two of the centers of, that, are, that we're looking for to drive total global economic growth in coming decades. But they're still so held back by this childhood malnutrition and stunting problem. I mean, you wonder why some places in the world remain so poor. It's because too many of their children are getting off to a lousy start in life. Collectively, then, this weakens our trading partners. It limits the global opportunities. So that's the final ripple, the impact on the entire world. So what happens with those, those ripples after the stone is in the pond? They eventually come to shore. They impact everybody. The toll on the global economy, again, through calculations of the World Bank, the IMF, kind of everybody who totes these numbers and calculates things, the total toll on the global economy is about three and a half trillion dollars. Three and a half trillion dollars with a T every year. The amount of discretionary spending by Congress, so not the mandatory spending and, 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 and mandated spending that on, on all these programs that, has to, that, that the spending has to go on, but the discretionary impact, that budget of Congress is about four trillion dollars a year. So when you think about it, this total global impact on the world economy of childhood stunting and malnutrition Three and a half trillion is pretty close to the size of the discretionary spending of Congress in, our, in, in, in uh, the budget of the United States. So it's this huge impact. And these are big numbers. They're, they're mind-blowing, astounding numbers. But to me, the, 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 and after kind of spending all this time with these families and watching these children grow through the thousand days, I think perhaps the greatest cost of malnutrition and stunting are immeasurable. It's a poem not written, or, or a song not sung, or a gadget not invented, or it's a new horizon not explored. It's not an innovation, it's an innovation that's not nourished. It's, it's, it's a cure that's not discovered. What might a child have contributed to all of us? Were they not stunted and malnourished? And so in that sense, you see how a stunted child anywhere in the world becomes a stunted child everywhere. This lost chance of greatness for any child becomes a lost chance of greatness for all of us. One in four of our children in the world today are stunted, posing this tremendous opportunity loss for all of us. That then to me is the central outrage of our time. What this ebb flow that Dr. Borlaug has warned about means to all of us. So whether these stunted children, no matter where they are, they're an impact to all of us. So that's why we have to continue with this great work and all the great work you're doing here and, and continue with the, with the legacy of Dr. Borlaug because it is this criminal negligence without extenuation that, that, that we're being uh, caring and burdened uh, with all of us. So what are we doing to ourselves as a world, as a humanity, by allowing this to continue to abide among us?
So I just wanted to, to, to end and then we can open up to questions and I'd be delighted to entertain any questions or have a discussion on any of this or anything else that's on your mind. Just from my perspective as a journalist, uh, the importance of the storytelling and hopefully telling the stories of the science and the scientists and the great work uh, that's being done here. Uh, and Richard, I mean, you could confirm this. Uh, uh, Chris Doswell, uh, who had worked for so long with Dr. Borlaug, and then Ken Quinn and others that I've talked to, I said, what was the contemporary reporting that was going on during the Green Revolution? What was the storytelling at that time? We even asked Dr. Borlaug that, and he was like, and all of them, there wasn't really any because nobody really knew what it was that we were doing at the time until we knew as scientists, but kind of what the impact of it was, well, we didn't know what that was. And then the Nobel Peace Prize, well, that was a great surprise. What? For this work? So where's the storytelling that goes on with that? So the, contem the contemporary storytelling of all the work and slaying and cutting this new Gordian knot that confronts us. That's why I think the storytelling is so important. I and mean, kind of working with the scientists and the science to explain, here's why this is so important. Here's why we need all this investment. And we can't, we, we, we got to break out of this ebb tide and get the full tide, uh, the high tide flowing again on all of this. And so as a journalist, I've often wondered and, and seen the work that kind of everybody here is doing in the science and in the humanitarians out on the front, you know, in the NGOs, and kind of in awe of all that work, and then often asking myself, gee, what can I do? I, I, what can I do? I'm, I'm, I'm just a journalist. What is my role in all of this? And so I figured I can raise the clamor and say, here's the outrage and here's the inspiration and to inspire them. My inspiration then in particular goes back to 2003, later than obviously with my talks and conversations with Dr. Borlaug in kind of the precious uh, couple of years before he passed away. It's in 2003. Uh, I was based in Zurich, Switzerland for the Wall Street Journal at the time, not writing about banks and financial institutions. Fortunately, we had other reporters at the Wall Street Journal based in Frankfurt and London who could like do that and, and actually understand it. Uh, and so I was unburdened of doing that. But what I was doing based in Zurich was writing about humanitarian and development issues. After 9-11 and President Bush in his first address to Congress, and I'm watching this on television from, from our home in, in, in Zurich. And he says, my fellow Americans, I know and I think you are all asking the same question that myself and my administration are asking. Why do they hate us so much? That would allow these emotions to and these passions to result in this, this horrible attack uh, on, that, on that day in, in, in the United States. So I'm watching that from, from Zurich and figuring, oh, uh, yeah, I've got a couple of ideas of why they might hate us so much. It was all from all my reporting as a foreign correspondent. So I sent a note to my editors in New York at the Journal and said, hey, maybe we should kind of you know, think about this seriously, maybe put together a series of stories of kind of how these emotions and kind of the attitudes around the world towards the United States and kind of where that comes from. And they said, oh, yeah, it's a great idea. Go, go forth and yeah, come up with some ideas. Uh, first one that I came to was, because of my reporting on humanitarian development issues, was the impact of our policies, unintended consequences, which then becomes a big part of the book enough, the unintended consequences of some of our, of our policies that have an impact abroad, anything kind of short of a declaration of war, yeah, that'll have an impact. Uh, and the first one came to was our agriculture uh, policies. Uh, the Farm Bill, a quintessential piece of American domestic legislation, but it has this huge impact around the rest of the world. The impact of our food aid policy and how, and how that was constructed. Uh, why Scott Kilman, who was our domestic, our, 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 our egg correspondent at the Journal while I was overseas, we were then talking about this. And it was, you know, how come the Green Revolution never got to Africa? Why are the hungriest people in the world smallholder farmers? So we set forth to report on that. And that then fortunately brought, brought in my life then into contact with, uh, uh, with Dr. Borlaug. Scott had been meeting with him regularly in his work on, as an agriculture correspondent. Uh, and so it was at that time, what happened in Africa when the famine of Ethiopia hits in 2003? 
It was the first great hunger crisis and first famine of the 21st century, of this grand new millennium of ours, after all this progress in the previous century and all the work coming out of the Green Revolution. What? 14 million people in Ethiopia in 2003 on the doorstep of starvation, being kept alive if they were going to survive at all by international food aid that was coming into the country. Most of it, or a lot, the majority of it coming from the United States, so hooray for that. But then you got into it and you saw kind of all kind of the machinations of food aid and how that coming into a country and, and, and what, what kind of that can do to the local uh, uh, agriculture scene and then to the attitudes of the farmers. You could kind of see all that in play. And it was, so I should have advanced to that slide, so you could have been looking at something nicer. That's one of the farm families in the last hunger season. Uh, I figured, okay, I have to go to, I have to, go to Ethiopia uh, to write about this and what's going on. We brought this medieval suffering with us into the 21st century. The 14 million, because Ethiopia, of course, had gone through this on a regular basis and in 19... 84, 85, the horrible famine that was there that they calculate maybe you know, result in the deaths of a million people. Uh, it led to kind of an international, I mean, for many of us, it's kind of this, this apocal moment where we're looking at that and saying, my God, this should never happen again. All kind of the celebrity activism starts from there. The Live Aid concerts, we are the world. We can't allow this to happen again. So here we were in 2003, 19 years after that, and it was happening again. And the 14 million was a higher number. Fortunately, far fewer died because the world was on, was on alert of that. Back then, it was a communist government. There's no hunger here in 84 and 85 until the BBC showed these horrible, awful scenes. By 2003, the international community was more aware of this. They were trying to, to do things on the ground, increase production for various factors than this, this, the drought, but then all these other factors were there that there's, there's so many people are on the verge of, of starvation. So I go to Addis Ababa. First day in the capital of Ethiopia, I'm meeting with the World Food Program that's involved in this huge task of then feeding these 14 million people. Rinder conference room, big conference table, unfurled a, a huge map of Ethiopia and a big map of Africa, and they said, here's the hunger zones and here's the crisis, because the next day I was going to be traveling with them to some of these hunger zones. And one of the WFP uh, staffers that I was going to be traveling with kind of gave me a piece of advice, which to me sounded like a pretty ominous warning. And he said, Roger, looking into the eyes of someone dying of hunger becomes a disease of the soul. Because what you see is that nobody should have to be dying of hunger. Pretty that now, in 2003, in this grand new millennium of ours, particularly 19 years after all this international handholding, never again should this happen, and now I have never again is happening again. It becomes this disease of the soul. And I'm like, disease of the soul? What's this guy talking about? That you go to these places and travel, and it's like, okay, you take all these precautions for your physical health, you know, the, the malaria medication, I mean, a meningitis shot, or you're, on, you're on, you know, aware of any cholera outbreaks. She's talking about a disease of the soul. The next day, we're down in one of the hunger zones. We're on this plateau, it was the market area uh, of the town. There was no market activity, but there was a huge warren of, 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 of tents, huge kind of military type tents that had been set up by the international relief organizations, by, by the Ethiopian uh, Disaster uh, Preparedness uh, Center. And they were filled with dozens and dozens and dozens of, of children on the verge of just starving to death in, 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 in just awful scenes. And so we kind of parted the flaps of one of the tents and walked inside. And I, 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 I was like speechless. I, I didn't know what to say because there were children that were literally right there on the doorstep of starvation. Just kind of walked through the tent and through this, this kind of massive suffering, kind of trying to process it all. I'm like, well, what am I going to do? How do I even ask questions about this? And so I walked until I came to this father and son. And I stopped there, and these were the eyes then that for the very first time I looked, I looked into the eyes of people that were dying of hunger. I felt ashamed of myself because I had been a foreign correspondent already for almost two decades by that time. 
had been in Africa for a number of years. And to me, I'd written about hunger and malnutrition. It was kind of like the, 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 the background noise of Africa, that it's there. It was in some of my stories on debt relief or kind of economic problems. But I never really looked into the eyes of anybody dying of hunger before, until this. And so I stopped there and talked to Tesfaya, the, the dad, the father, because in his eyes, there's like, and in, and in the boy, Hargirso, you know, in the father's eyes, there's, there's this kind of wandering, or there's this resignation. As I talked to him, there was a wondering of, what have I done to my son? There was this guilt, this guilt that Borlaug was talking about. How, how is it, has this perpetuated? What have I done? For my son, and he had carried his son, his son Hargirso, he's about five years old, kind of the youngest in the family, so the most vulnerable, and he had carried him like a loaf of bread, if only they had a loaf of bread, to this emergency feeding tent, kind of walking on the back of a wagon, getting off, walking again into the tents, and his son at, at, at five years old weighed just 27 pounds. So by the time I'm there and I take, I, I, I'm seeing them, so this picture is maybe seven days or 10 days afterwards, he's already getting the uh, therapeutic feeding, so he's starting to recover. We can see the malnutrition and, and the swelling of the face. His arms and legs are too weak to stand on, which is why he's propped up between the legs of his dad. And he has, uh, uh, you can see the dad and, and kind of the thinness uh, of, of him and his ribs uh, coming out. So I talk to them and the eyes of Hargirso, I mean, they're just blank. There's, there's, no, there's no impishness, there's no uh, kind of beseeching of a child of that age. They're like empty, dark holes. And the dad, as I said, Tisfaya, kind of this, this wandering, and when I talked to him, so what have I done to my child? And I go, well, how do I respond to that? And then I figured, that's the wrong question. The, the right question is, or the, the better question is, what have we done to your child? How have we collectively allowed this to happen three years into this new millennium of ours? After all the progress, this then does indeed become a disease of my soul. As a foreign correspondent, we're used to traveling from uh, uh, place to place and country to country and story to story. You report something. What's next? You write about it. You move on to the next story. Editors, hey, where are you going next? What's your next stories about? This story, when I left the tent that day, I knew I couldn't just write about that story and walk away and go on to the next story as I would have as a foreign correspondent. This then, as a disease of the soul, then it was, it was it, you know, they talk about uh, kind of these, these, these disruptive moments, hopefully positive disruptive moments in a life, in a career. This was my moment of great disruption, both as a person as a human, and then as a, a journalist. This is the story I needed to keep coming back to and coming back to and coming back to. So when I left the tent that day, they were telling or, or left talking to Tesfaya, uh, the doctors and nurses and humanitarian workers then were also there and were saying, so like, what's going to happen to her gear? So when they were telling Tesfaya, your son has had such a severe shock and is in such a weakened state. It's a thousand days and I talked to the dad from the time of birth. Uh, his first thousand days were lousy. The, the, the mother uh, was, was, was sickly, uh, and he was a low birth weight child. So the thousand days were lousy, then this famine hits a couple of years later. The staff is then saying to everybody there, we don't know what's going to happen to Hard Gear, so if he's going to survive, because his shock was so great. So they were kind of trying to prepare Hard uh, Test Fire, the dad, that you know, we don't know. So I leave and I'm thinking about that. Well, whatever happened to Hargirso? I continued to write about these stories, made a couple more trips back to, to Ethiopia in 2003 to try to explain to the readers of the Wall Street Journal what was going on, how, how could this still be happening. Went to other places in Africa over the next years. Then was writing about it, eventually moved back to the States, writing about food insecurity and hunger and poverty in the United States. But in the back of my mind, and deep in this diseased soul, whatever happened to Hargirso? Had he survived? So five years later, then in, that was 2003, so 2008, 2009 is kind of finishing the write and the reporting of the first book enough, went back to Ethiopia and talked to the World Food Program 
is he still there? Is the family still there? They got back and said, Tesfai is still there. We found him. And so kind of went to the village. Tesfai comes running from his field with a machete in his hand, running towards me. He still has the machete in his hand. He kind of embraces me still with the machete in his hand. It's like, what have I gotten myself into? And he gives me a hug. And I said, do you remember who I am? And he says, yes, you wrote down the name of my son when he was so sick. I said, how dear so? How is he? And he said he survived. And so then this little child, start, this child runs across the street, her gear so. Now he's about 10 years old, and you can see the impact of the stunting. So he's still so tiny, right? Tesfaya still suffered the impact. The knockback on resilience of, of a famine or great hunger shock, that, that becomes the most pernicious impact of any kind of famine or hunger crisis is on those who survive, and particularly the children who survive, because this they carry with them throughout their lives. Hargirso had survived, hooray, but he clearly wasn't thriving. Another five years go by, I'm beginning to do the work on the first thousand days. One of the, part of the story is in Uganda, as I said. And so on a, my first trip to Uganda, I go through Ethiopia. Now Hargirso is about 15. Is Hargirso still there? How is he doing now? There's Hargirso at 15. To me, Tespaya is no giant, his dad, but so to me, he came up to the bottom of my ribcage. So clearly, physically stunted. But he's happy, he's got a big smile on his face, and he's telling me about how he's in school. Asked Tespaya, Hargirso's in school? He said, yeah, he kept, he kept pestering me. He wanted to go to school with the other kids. I hadn't had him in school, because I figured he wouldn't do very well in school. And we had tried like a couple of years uh, before, but he kept getting sick. He'd get about a malaria, and, and that would really set him back because of just his weakened immune system and things. But yes, he's in school, so great. Hargirso's in school, so this is the physical stunting. I went down the pathway to the school, talked to the headmaster. So, hey, I come to see Hargirso. Oh, he's in that building over there. So went into the building, first grade. 15 years old, first grade. This day, he was starting to learn his alphabet. They were vowel consonant combinations. They were on B. He's making progress. He's writing in his little notebook for the first time writing something. B, ba, bo, bu, bai. So they're practicing those sounds. 15 years old, first grade, beginning to learn the alphabet. Cognitive stuff. And if you look at the other children around him who are about seven or eight years old or nine years old, he looks the same age as them. What might a child have accomplished for all of us? Were he not stunted in the thousand days? The lost chance of greatness for her dear so becomes this lost chance of greatness for all of us. So I hope in a couple weeks to be back in Ethiopia as I begin work on this next book of this new Gordian knot that Jake and I will begin reporting on later today. Uh, I hope to see them again. Uh, they're still there, so I, I, I have reports from the WFP that, yep, our gears on test fire are still there. And I'll say, well, how is he now at 20? What is he contributing to his community, to his family? So this, to me, this, is, this is, continues to be the outrage in our world. It propels me. I know it propels all of us. This is why we do what we do. So God bless you for what you're doing. Continue the legacy of Dr. Borlaug in this 50th year of his winning the Nobel uh, Peace Prize. And yeah, let it be so that we bring the high tide back again. We end this criminal negligence and we finally conquer hunger and malnutrition and we solve this new Gordian knot uh, that presents us. So thank you very much. Some minute for questions. Are there? Or Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yes. Well, thank you very much for that uh, really interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm a professor of nutrition here, and I actually Ooh. got initially interested in nutrition to work on world food problems. Uh, but I had a professor of nutrition who quickly dissuaded me from right. that, saying it's not a nutritional issue. It has nothing to do with nutrition. It's all political. Mm. And so um, that is one issue I was wondering if you could speak to, and, and particularly the political situation mm -hmm. is the corruption issue. Right. The second issue is that when I started in college as an undergraduate, there was a tremendous 
interest and understanding of the importance of population control. Mm -hmm. Paul Ehrlich had published the right. population bomb. We were doing things in classes, modeling population growth. That has disappeared. Right. There is no problem. Right. And in my opinion, trying to solve the world problem, food problems, it's like a foot race where they keep moving the finish line further and right. further away. And so I would be interested in your comments about what you have seen in terms of governments trying to deal with issues related to population control. Yeah, thank you. We, we uh, use Mark's book comments for the recording. We have I should, questions. Oh, right. I should repeat them. Right. Okay. So the question is on, yeah, the importance of, of uh, uh, nutrition and you get involved uh, in nutrition, but an early professor kind of dissuading you <laughs> from that fact that it's not a nutritional issue, it's not an issue of nutrition, but it's a question of politics and, and corruption and again, this kind of give a damn. Uh, and then... Population. Oh, and then, yeah. It was rattling around my brain. And then the issue of, uh, yeah, the, the, still the population ever uh, increasing. And there seems to be no talk about that and hasn't been talked about that for, for quite a while. Uh, and so where do we stand uh, on that and what can we do? Uh, the nutritional issue, yeah, it, it, it's, it's just so uh, puzzling. And for me as a, as a lay person, Kind of nutrition, if there ever was a big push on it, and it was part of the, 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 the Green Revolution, the agriculture, and of course the feeding the people, but it kind of fell off the edge of a, of a table. And like the, the amount of money that was of overseas development aid that was going into nutrition was like negligible. You're right, nobody was talking about it. Uh, this huge gap, again, as a, as a lay person and not a scientist or an ag person or, or, or a farmer. How it was it was it was inconceivable to me how this huge gap had developed between agriculture and nutrition. Agriculture efforts and agriculture development efforts were about increasing yields, ever increasing yields, and increasing the incomes of farmers. Great goals. But anything, if there was ever any talk about, well, what about the nutritional aspect of the food that you're growing and the increasing yields, you know, what about the nutritious value of them? That was all dismissed and said, if it's going to impact yields, if it's going to impact farmer income, if it's going to be difficult for farmers to adapt these crops to, to the planting, to sell any surpluses that they would have, we don't want to hear about it. Nutrition, they said, the agriculture folks, nutrition is a health problem. And the health ministries of the world said, nah, it's not our problem. We've got so many problems dealing with kind of so many health problems in our countries, particularly in the developing world, and the, 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 the disease du jour that we have to deal with. Uh, nope, nutrition's not our problem. So nutrition kind of fell between like the legs of a table and it became kind of this unwanted stepchild of international health. I don't think there's a single ministry of nutrition anywhere in the world. There's proposals that we should probably have one in this country. Uh, and so Dan Glickman, former Ag Secretary and my colleague at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, he's kind of raising the clamor for, yeah, shouldn't we have like an institute of nutrition or something here that, that's really looking at what's kind of becoming of our population? And so, yeah, it's this, it's this, it's this mystery of what, what has happened to nutrition. Now it's coming back more into play with the first thousand days in recognition of that and, and in nutrition so uh, important for that. Uh, people, there's a whole scaling up nutrition uh, international movement that's going on to focus people's attention on the importance of nutrition. Uh, the advocates are getting, are getting more, uh, raising the clamor on this. There's a global nutrition resolution that's before Congress. I think the House has adopted it. Uh, maybe the Senate, one of them has, and they're trying to get sponsors and, and, and to build momentum uh, for the other one. So hopefully that gains ground. And I think it was just, was it Harvard? The Harvard Medical School said, to which I tweeted, finally, they said there should be more attention paid to nutrition in the education in our med schools and the education of our doctors. Because in doing the first thousand days book and talked to plenty of doctors and particularly one who was running a clinic in Guatemala and it was his, his uh, 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 population that he was working with there up in the Western Highlands where he was doing a nutrition rehabilitation uh, uh, program that was involved in nutrition particularly in the first thousand days and he was a doctor at Johns Hopkins and had been trained there. He said in all his training and whatever, the six years of training to become a doctor or something, maybe 15 minutes was spent on nutrition. What? 
It's the foundation of a person's individual health, and that nutrition, nutrition is everywhere in international development. It is the cornerstone of it. You want to do an education program? You better have the nutrition right, or the kids are going to be studying on an empty stomach in school, and they're not going to learn anything. You know, you want to build a, a water project? Well, that's fine, but what's the nutritional aspect of, of people? An agriculture program, what's the nutrition of the crops that you're growing? So it's a fundamental you know, issue. So nutrition is everywhere in international development, but it's nowhere in international development strategy. So that's been this huge missing link that now hopefully people are beginning to address it, because at least they're aware of it, right? And so if Harvard says this, well, maybe other schools that then say, oh, if Harvard's doing this, maybe most people should know about nutrition. And then on the population, uh, <coughs> growth that continues, I mean, the name of this series, Nine Billion and Counting. Uh, and that was one of the reasons why Dr. Borlaug was slamming his fist and his palm on the table uh, that day. The words that he said after slamming his, table, his fist on his palm on the table was that damn World Bank. Uh, because the, as you know, the whole structural adjustment that came uh, out of uh, the World Bank and part of the Washington Consensus in the 80s uh, basically did horrible damage to uh, the smallholder farmers of the world and was basically part of the reason of the, of the neglect of, of agriculture development. Basically brought in this ebb tide that, that Borlaug had warned about. Uh, and then it was also that, gee, we still haven't gotten ourselves ahead of the population uh, curve. And the number keeps growing. Uh, the demands from this increasing population, an increasingly prosperous population, hooray! So, the Green Revolution ushered in this huge, I think it's historic in, in, in the world's history, this move out of poverty and people into the middle class, but their diets change. They're eating more, they're eating more food. Hooray for that. That puts greater strains on the, on the, the, the food chain. So how do we deal with all this? So yeah, and I, I think Richard's really talking about, I mean, dealing with population, you know, any kind of population control aspects is just extremely sensitive because it does then become a political uh, issue. It becomes kind of a social engineering issue. It's I mean, kind of the China one, 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 uh, China's one child uh, policy, and kind of now the, the retrenchment and the reversal of, of that or stepping away from that. But we have, what do you do on this front? So I think that's still one of the great, uh, you know, really tough questions that confronts uh, the world. And still, you know, kind of with Dr. Borlaug's work, that it's kind of this one two punch. It's the agriculture production. But then doing something about you know population growth uh, at the same time. So Ethiopia, when I when I went there in, in, in first in 2003, I think the population of the country was about 70 million. And so now when I go back in a couple of weeks, I think it's like approaching 100 million. So Ethiopia then continues to be this laboratory of they made all this progress. The stunting numbers are down. Uh, their maternal death, their infant death numbers are down. Uh, their malnutrition numbers are down. Uh, their agriculture production is up, uh, but this population continues to advance, uh, you know, at, at kind of the same or if not even an accelerated pace. So, so those two questions are right on the right on the button of what we need to, to deal with. Yes, please. Um, right. I'd also like to thank you for your talk today. I really appreciated it. Um, I'm wondering again. So you mentioned that political will um, is one of the larger barriers that you see to achieving um, much movement in this area. And I'm wondering if you have any examples or insights of where political will was successfully ignited in some capacity, and, um, and if so, is there, like, I'm kind of wondering if at the scale of that success, if that was um, in terms of like a local, mid-sized, regional, or, or international government efforts. Um, and, and I'm particularly interested in the case of Right. Uh, hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the question of, yeah, I should just have him speak louder or go over with, her, with the microphone. Um, yeah, the, the, the will. yeah, the political will, kind of any examples of that, kind of how that translates into reality or successes of things on kind of a regional, uh, local, kind of national, international uh, level, right? Uh, there was a most miraculous thing that happened almost a year ago in Washington. So we're coming up about the year anniversary of it. Uh, and the Global Food Security Act was reauthorized. It was first adopted by Obama and uh, his Feed the Future program, which is one example of then the political will that's then coming out of 
uh, the food crisis of 2007, 2008, kind of realizing, you know, early on in the, the Obama uh, administration, they figured, uh, yeah, some kind of renewed push of American leadership on ending hunger through agriculture development could be a legacy issue of, of his administration. I think it is, but it's one that he doesn't even talk that much about, so kind of, you know, confounded um, on that. But as part of the Feed the Future then, which put smallholder farmers at the center of attention, reversing the neglect of the smallholder farmers, which is part of this, this, this damn World Bank effort of, of structural adjustment, kind of a negligence of all that, uh, put smallholder farmers back uh, at the center of things. It was uh, in cooperation with the governments uh, that here's some aid, that we're gonna increase aid on agriculture development but you all need to be taking the lead on this in your countries because it's your agriculture system, it's your hungry and malnourished population. So where are the holes in that and what you're trying to do and we will try to assist through the US and all the support that they can have. But then came last year, about this time, when the Global Food Security Act was up for reauthorization. It was like, oh, so what's gonna happen with this administration, with the America First uh, stuff? and you know, uh, kind of borders and malls and all these other things, what's gonna happen to this? It passed and was adopted unanimously. It was led by both Republicans in both the House and, uh, Democrats and Republicans in both the House and the Senate. And it was basically passed and adopted unanimously. And that shows that there is a, a certain amount of political will and this political give a damn to continue with this and recognize that American leadership in this has been important uh, down through the years. But, and I, I've kind of written about this a number of times that, I mean, the thing that has made America great in the eyes of so many people around the world has been America's leadership on the agriculture development front and the push to end hunger and malnutrition. Um, and so, so that's you know, one example of that it's there. How do we, how do we energize these members of Congress that supported this in a unanimous sense, you know, I've yet to find anybody kind of in Congress or an administration that's like for hunger. I mean, sometimes you wonder, you know, by their actions, you know, it's like, oh, let's get rid of Meals on Wheels, right? It was a proposal a couple of years ago. It was like, why would you do that? It's meals for the elderly and, and food assistance. And then two years ago, the administration proposed, we're gonna eliminate the McGovern Dole School Feeding Program globally. But why don't you do that? They said lack of evidence that it actually works. But then everybody came and said, oh, you want evidence? Here's the evidence uh, of, of yes, how it works. And then you know, the, the Congress uh, folks from uh, Kansas and South Dakota, where McGovern and Dole come from, said, yeah, that as long as Senator Dole is still breathing, and for many years in the future, this program isn't going anywhere. And it's substantial. So there are these pockets and these glimmers of, of flashes of, of kind of nobility um, on this front, and these champions that will rise and say no, and they put their foot down. Uh, but how do we make that a consistent uh, movement? This being an election year, I mean, this is the the the, the time. And Pat, we were talking about this last night. This is the time. Anytime there's anybody running for office, locally, regionally, statewide, nationwide. What are you doing on these issues? What was, what's your, your position on the global nutrition uh, resolution? That's now before the, the both houses of Congress. Uh, the child nutrition acts uh, that come up every year. Why is there a fight over them all the time? Just pass it. Don't talk about how much money we can cut. Talk about how much money can we add to it. Because uh, our kids have to get off to the best start in life. The SNAP program, you know, the WIC program. They're always trying to cut back on those things. Foreign aid, do we actually need it? You know, stop those discussions uh, and just say, okay, how do we make things better? How do we increase our investments in these things, uh, particularly on those fronts? So, uh, yeah, the, the struggle continues, but there are, there's champions that are out there. They just need to be kind of energized and to be told, no, it really matters what you're doing on these things. And so, yeah. Here, no, one last question, please. Do you have any issues um, as a reporter with, say, it's like editorial or, or post higher up at people who have the Wall Street Journal, just what you want to spray and how are you just working for them? Is your reporting what you report or how you report? 
Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So particularly, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, had uh, kind of how was kind of the, the, in, in the reporting of all this, particularly the Wall Street Journal, uh, kind of relationships with, with editors and, and their kind of enthusiasm uh, for these stories, and how did that uh, impact me or the stories or kind of any, any kind of editorial uh, control? Uh, so, at the Wall Street Journal, particularly in 2003, after the first story uh, about Javier Sotasvaya and you know, this hunger is back with us, with a vengeance in 2003. Uh, after that story, my editor, the page one editor of the Wall Street, the old Wall Street Journal with the long feature stories on the, the, the front, running up and down, no photos. Although I think, I think by then they might have been running photos, so I don't know if we had a photo of, of these guys. Uh, but the page one editor kind of set me notes, said, hey, it was a really interesting story, what's next? And so I figured, okay, he's talking about, yeah, what's next somewhere else? And so I said, oh, there's another story on something somewhere else in Africa. And he wrote back right away and says, yeah, that sounds like an interesting story. But what I meant is, what's next? Do you have anything more that you want to say about Ethiopia? And I said, well, great, I do. Uh, and so proposed another story, wrote that, he runs that, and he says, again, what's next? Again, well, oh, there's a story over here. Uh, no, I'm feeling you have something more to say about Ethiopia. I said, I do. Uh, and so did another story. And then it was like, oh, as long as we're on this subject, uh, there's more to write about, about hunger in Africa, uh, particularly in 2003. What was exp AIDS, HIV AIDS uh, was, was continuing to explode. What emerged was a, what was called and has been called the new variant famine that in most instances of famine and food crisis uh, and hunger crisis, it's the crops that have failed. What was happening then with the explosion of HIV AIDS, it wasn't the crops that were failing, it was that the farmers that would plant the crops were either dying or were too sick to plant the crops to begin with. So when the World Food Program, using their old metrics of going into a place, who needs food aid? Where did the crops fail? What happened on your farm? They were then confronting a whole new section of the population in these countries, particularly in Southern Africa, why are you hungry? Did your crops fail? No. What happened? Well, we never planted the crops because my parents have died or you know, they're too uh, sick to do that or we just have no more money left to plant. And so then it was, so I started then writing about that. Eventually though, as I would then propose more stories on this, uh, I would get sometimes, not from this editor, but then from others, uh, that would say, Gee, Roger, that story kind of sounds similar to something else that we had done on the hunger front. Haven't we already done that story? What's new? And I would say, what's new is precisely that it's old. And it is a story that we've done before, but it's still with us, right? So that becomes the story of hunger that it you know, still abides with us. And then when it came back, eventually came back to the United States and then was based in Chicago Bureau from whence I came. Um, we then writing about hunger and poverty in the United States. And one of the editors in, in, in New York, uh, whose perspective of the world was basically from, you know, very New York-centric and very upper east side or west side, wherever he lived, and was going to write about hunger in the United States. And he said, well, I'm setting a pretty hard high bar for those stories, because I think I know, we all know pretty much about, yeah, hunger in the United States. And I said, oh, well, what do you know? And he said, well, it's kind of the homeless, it's the immigrants, it's you know refugees, it's minorities, it's mentally ill people. And I said, wrong, 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 on all fronts, because Feeding America, had the, the food bank uh, uh, organization, had just come out with a survey that said, here's who the, uh, the hungry in America are. And the majority have jobs. Uh, they are, the majority are Americans. Uh, the majority are white, um, and the majority know it's not an issue of mental illness. Uh, and so I said, whatever perceptions you have of hunger in the United States are wrong, and it would, I would assume it would be the same perception that most of the readers of the Wall Street Journal have. So I think there's a lot of writing to basically be done to say, here's what hunger in America looks like, uh, and poverty uh, in America. And so yeah, so it's kind of it's it's it both 
can kind of be a hindrance, kind of the, the, the attitude of the editors. But then if you're kind of working with them and they're open-minded people, as kind of most of them are, uh, you can kind of move past that and actually craft then a series of, or just coverage that still addresses uh, these issues. Great, well. So thank you, unless there's, oh. We, we, we know that, uh, that uh, Dr. Borlaug wasn't always very fond of journalists. Right. I'll bet he came to admire you a great deal. Well, thank you. The, so the question is that, that we know that, yeah, Dr. and people here know that more intimately, uh, that Dr. Borlaug always wasn't that fond of, of journalists, uh, but he's betting uh, that, yeah, he appreciated our work. Um, and yeah, uh, he did, I think, particularly, you know, kind of knowing the Wall Street Journal and the care that we would take with our stories and the reporting that we kept coming back to him. Uh, and asking about this and asking questions that I think were, were bothering him and kind of, you know, showing and absorbing kind of all the outrage, but then the inspiration uh, that he had. And uh, his daughter, Jeannie, and then and granddaughter, Julie, uh, whenever I see him, they laugh and they said, Roger, every time we see you, we are reminded of uh, our father, or grandfather, uh, you know, in our observations with him and you guys interacting with him and asking the questions, you were about the only two people who could basically keep him on the track of a single-minded storytelling as opposed to wandering off on other things and then having problems getting back to the question. Because you guys would say, uh, yeah, okay, but what about this, right? We need these details. What was going on back then? And he would be like, oh, okay. Then he was back in time, you know, talking about uh, about that. So they said, yeah, you're basically the only one. And so they said it was helpful for them in understanding certain things that were going on at the time because that's what we needed to um, uh, get out of him. Because there wasn't, again, this really, there wasn't a lot of contemporary reporting that was going on uh, back at that time. Also, say with, with structural adjustment, we went back through, the, through the, the pages of the Wall Street Journal in the archives and you'd see the phrase mentioned. Uh, but again, nobody at the time knew the impact and the long term impact. Uh, of those policies in the Washington consensus at the time. And it was only when the, the, the food crisis that happened in 07, 08, every year the World Bank comes out with their annual development report, which is then this kind of seminal report that the whole development community kind of looks at, oh, here's what the World Bank is saying about something. The one in 2007, 2008 was finally on agriculture and smallholder farmers. It was the first one dealing with agriculture and smallholder farmers for 25 years. This is the world's leading poverty reduction organization. That's why they were set up. And for a quarter of a century, they didn't deal with agriculture and smallholder farmers because again, they figured they're too poor, too remote, too insignificant to deal with. We're not dealing with that. It was well known in the World Bank that you were not gonna rise in the ranks of the World Bank on the strength of an agriculture uh, program, so why even bother uh, with it? So that was kind of the tragedy of, of that time. And that, that was kind of, you know, absorbing that, that Dr. Borlaug would, would talk about and rail against. I think he felt, uh, yeah, that we were kind of uh, interesting people to talk to, <laughs> uh, to talk to and tell the story to, so. Thank you. Great.